Well, good afternoon. I am Jane Brennan, a Vice President of the League of Women Voters of Central Delaware County. On behalf of the League, I thank you and welcome you joining us today for the fourth Hot Topics program of the 2021-2022 year. Um, as many of you know, prior to the pandemic, the Hot Topics programs were luncheons with guest speakers. And we hope to return to the face-to-face -face programs sometime, although who knows when the near future will be. Um, our most recent challenge with the Omicron variant has certainly interfered with that goal. We have been amazed and delighted at the very positive response we have to these having these programs as Zoom meetings. As, a as of today, we had 60 people registered. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan civic organization committed to promoting political responsibility through informed and active participation in government, citizenship, and elections. Our motto is making democracy work. And we do that through registering people to vote, organizing and presenting candidate forums, <clears throat> providing candidate information through vote411.org, and hosting educational programs such as today's Hot Topic program. A core tenet of the League of Women Voters at the national, state, and local level, levels is a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, before we begin, we have a few housekeeping details for the Zoom meeting. All of the participants except the guest speaker, the moderators, and our technological wizard, Kathy Youngman, will be muted. The questions submitted prior to today have been shared with our guest speaker. Um, Nancy Schatz Hopko will introduce our guest speaker, Rosemary Hall, now. And um, she will act as moderator for any questions that are submitted via the chat. And Nancy, I'll thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Actually, Kathy's going to help me moderate the chat questions. Um, I'm a member of the board of the Central Delaware County League of Women Voters and chair of the newly formed Delaware County League of Women Voters Health Committee. And I, to that end, I invite anyone with interest in joining that health committee to uh, let me know. Now, I am very happy to introduce Rosemary Halt, who is probably well known to you. Rosemary has over 30 years experience as a healthcare professional specializing in health policy and public health. With degrees in pharmacy and public health, she has spent her career as an advocate in nonprofit and public organizations. Currently, Rosemary's chair of the Delaware County Board of Health. And prior to that, she served as director of the COVID Task Force for Delaware County and the COVID-19 liaison between Delaware County and Chester County. She worked for six years prior to that as the senior health policy uh, specialist for the maternal, maternity care coalition. She's been engaged for many years with the league and uh, is active in other civic organizations such as having been president of the University of Sciences Alumni Board of Directors. So with no further ado, I am happy to turn it over to Rosemary. Thanks for joining us, Rosemary. Thank you, everybody, and I'm just so happy to be here today. I love the League of Women Voters. I have told so many people that without the League, the health department would not be here. Um, you were the group that kept that political issue of a health department alive, um, really over the last 15 years, which is hard to believe. And um, your continued support and advocacy is critical. Um, you planted the seed and I believe that there is at least nine other counties now in Pennsylvania that are going to be advocating for county health departments. Given that we only have 10 county health departments under Act 215 in Pennsylvania right now, and having, we could almost double that, you know, not that that happens overnight, but, you know, it's, a, it's really a testament to um, when you're committed to something that's important for the public and you continue to advocate that the change does happen. So thank you, everyone, who um, has just been truly supportive over the last 15 years. So I'm going to pull up my uh, presentation. OK. 
Okay, can and everybody can see uh, my presentation right now. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, where we're at, so what I'm going to do today is just kind of outline um, some things of where the health department is and um, you know, what and part of this presentation is actually what we presented to the Pennsylvania Department of Health for our final approval. And we're still waiting for our final approval from the Pennsylvania Department of Health, but I, I'm feeling pretty confident that that's coming. Um, so some of this will just kind of over, out, you know, overview of where we are, where we're going. I threw in some slides on um, COVID um, because I'm back to being, I've been, uh, since August, I have come back as the COVID task force director in addition to being the chair of the Board of Health and pretty and the interim director of the health department. Um, but the new health department director starts on Tuesday. I can tell you, I'm not only counting the hours, I'm counting the minutes so I can start having <laughs> her take over some of these responsibilities. Um, and I will be continuing as the chair of the Board of Health, but not having three jobs would be really nice. So um, she's going to be coming on, and um, I think I'm going to just there we go. So what I wanted to just go over with you where where we are with the health department and what the health department is going to kind of look like. So public health 3.0 is really the model of a health department um, that we are structuring um, our Delaware County Health Department under. Um, why is that important? Because Act 315 in Pennsylvania is um, was really built in 1950 when health departments were really about providing a lot of clinical services because we didn't have insurance for everyone. So they were the providers of last resort. And so a health department, while they did community health things, they were really, their job was to be um, another doctor's office per se for people that fell through the cracks. In addition to doing all of the basic public health functions of that era, which was, you know, STDs and TBs and things like that. And we're still going to be doing that, but it 3.0 is our modern version of what a health department is and how it's going to operate in the future. And this has been approved, this is the model that's approved nationally by, um, you know, many of the national public health um, associations and including the CDC. Pennsylvania Department of Health is very excited because we would be the first real public health 3.0 model health department, and they hope that we will be the model for the future health departments in the county, in the state. Um, so what does that look like? So there's really five core tenants to um, public health 3.0. Um, what's really unique about it is this role of chief health strategist. So the health department is supposed to be what, um, health is supposed to look like in our county. And that that's looking at like, where do you put your interventions? So if we were looking, and we're gonna explain a little bit about data in a minute, but if you're looking at like how data informs our interventions, if then that says, okay, well, we're gonna look at the top, um, you know, 10 causes of death, the top 10 causes of morbidity or sickness in the county. And then um, how do we strategically go after them and really make an impact on that? And the chief health strategist is often designated, um, many health departments are changing their title of the health department director to a chief health strategist. Now, um, Melissa is really our new, Melissa Lyons is our new health department director from Erie County. And she has been one of the people um, really promoting this in Pennsylvania and is very excited to actually operationalize it um, in our county. And so she already is calling herself the chief health strategist. <laughs> Um, and then we have cross-sector collaborations. Um, so that's really working with the community and um, working with different groups that we may not have originally thought. So of course we work with the hospitals and um, other healthcare institutions, but maybe it's really engaging in um, you know, other groups in the county that you might not have thought of. So for example, really looking at um, the suicide prevention task force, I'll just use, or different groups like that that may um, really have crossover with the health department. Um, and we did do um, community um, meetings and um, you know town halls. And a lot of this came out through that, that people were really were looking for this cross-sector collaboration. Of course, we're gonna look to be accredited, but that's like a five-year process. So we're starting out, we're gonna be building all the things that we need for accreditation in the health department. Um, which is lucky because a lot of the health departments have to go backwards and redo a lot of their policies and procedures and things that would allow them to be accredited. And we're gonna be building that into it as we go. 
And then looking at data, data is so important. Um, <coughs> you know, one of the reasons I got involved in trying to get a health department was, you know, we had a lot of data for the county, but if you start breaking down the county, for example, the I-95 corridor, which is an industrialized area of the county, you know, has much different um, asthma rates and cancer rates than say, um, you know, parts of the county in the Western part that border Chester County. Sorry, I've been talking since seven o'clock this morning, so I'm gonna be taking sips of my water. So if we, um, you know, look at that data, again, that's a better way for us to inform how an intervention looks. So one of the really cool things, I was hoping to get it, but I couldn't um, format it in a way that would, you could really see it properly, but we've been doing GIS mapping. We started doing that with our epidemiologists and the county GIS team. And so one of the first things we did was we in, um, put the GIS map and we put in where all the highest COVID deaths were. And then we overlapped that where the vaccination rates were. And then because we had a huge syphilis um, epidemic in the county right now, because um, you know we don't can't just have a pandemic, we have to have an epidemic with it. We overlapped that. And that was really telling to us because the places that had high death rates, lower vaccination rates, and high syphilis were really correlating. You could see it on the map. And so these are the kinds of things that will help us with our interventions because now you're looking at, it's not maybe necessarily that people are anti-vaxxers, but maybe there's a language barrier. There's a huge language issue in our Upper Darby area, for example. Upper Darby has, high school has 72 different languages spoken in that area. So, you know, is it, it, there's multiple factors um, and a lot of them will, will probably come out as around the social determinants of health. So it goes back to our intervention can't be just saying giving, you know, going in and treating people for syphilis because the syphilis is probably related to a whole bunch of other social issues that we're not picking up, but that led people to be more at risk for COVID deaths and led people to be more at risk for other um, comorbidities. So that's just a basic example. And, and we're really excited to start um, diving into analyzing data and that's not gonna happen overnight. But having access to the data that we need is critical. And we will finally get access to these, all these great systems um, once we're approved. And then finally, explore and being innovative. So some of the things I just talked about are really being innovative, but how do we fund that? And looking for funding is really critical. Um, so, you know, of course, there's the, the state funding that we get, there's county funding that we get, and there's federal funding that we get. But how do we look for other um, types of funding. And so we're reaching out to national organizations that may be interested in like the Kaiser Foundation, may be interested in a new health department in the largest county in the United States that has, doesn't have one and how, and, and with some of the highest death rates from COVID. So how, how would that help and how, how do, would they want to maybe do some kind of intervention? So there are the things that we're just starting to explore. They're very exciting. And I could talk about 3.0 all day, but let me move into, um, foundational public health services. So these are the things that I was talking about are like the long-term services under Act 315 that are make up the core functioning of a health department. And I don't want you to think that we want, aren't going to do these. We're gonna do these, but we're gonna do it in a way that as I just described with 3.0 that really makes them more robust. Um, but you know, of course we're gonna be doing um, communicable disease control, really looking at, you know, for example, syphilis and um, STDs in the county, um, chronic disease and injury prevention. So really looking, one of the things that those comes up is um, we have a lot of firearm deaths in Delaware County. So, you know, really looking at um, partnering with people and how do we address that environmental public health. And for many people, um, particularly in the league, I know there's a lot of environmental health concerns in, in Delaware County. So um, my first you know, direction has been for epidemiologists to really start thinking about how do we break down the data um, more into these zones that gives us a better picture of what's actually happening. And then with, you know, having the data, then you can start to target the inter intervention. You can monitor it. You can actually look for funding, but without that data, you can't do any of that. And then maternal child health and family health and really excite about the potential in these areas um, Dr. Monica Taylor, um, who is now um, president of council, 
is really um, looking into having um, a baby first program in the county and baby first goes in every woman, no matter economic status or social status, um, would have the opportunity before she leaves the hospital to have um, an interaction with a community health worker just so that they know what services are available in the county um, and then, or you know, to, to kind of evaluate if they um, might be in need of additional help. Um, every new mom has challenges and they're different. Um, and it, you know, having that opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction before they leave the hospital is, um, has been successful. And um, Allegheny County is the one um, in Pennsylvania that really has had great success with this program. We're also gonna be looking at doulas, community doulas help women um, and they're, they're based in the community, they're trained in the community, and they really help people to um, look towards, um, you know, this interaction with the doula helps them through their pregnancy. They're not a midwife. They're somebody that really helps with like breastfeeding or answering questions about their body and being an advocate for them with their healthcare provider. Um, and we particularly found this really impactful for um, immigrant communities and low-income areas. And then um, accessing linkage to, with crit clinical care. And so while somebody may come into our clinic, for example, a COVID vaccine, you know, that is an opportunity to also um, see would somebody need, do they have a primary care physician? And if not, why not? Do they need insurance? Do they, you know, so linking them and seeing all of these as opportunities for people to, um, to grow and to um, improve their health. Uh, just really briefly, this is the Public Health Steering Committee that helped form the Health Department. Now the Public Health Steering Committee is, um, is finished. They've completed their task over two years, very dedicated um, folks. And these are the organizations that they represented in the county. Um, and we were really grateful um, to have so many people give so much of their time. We had lots and lots of meetings over the last two years. Um, and you know, as you can see, we had representatives from the health systems, um, from the medical societies, medical examiner, um, and then also um, elected official, um, and then also, and as well as some universities. So, really, a comprehensive group of people that um, you know really made this success. And I, I do want to call out um, the foundation for Delaware County, which has gone above and beyond um, in many ways in helping the steering committee um, meet meet its goals and including providing some financial support that allowed us to do things like have um, a public campaign for COVID and a public campaign um, with a, a resources and toolkits for the health department opening. So um, really great partners that have made this a success. So the steering committee, um, one of the first things that we did was make our vision, mission and values, which everybody knows are the basics for any organization. Um, and you know we really, uh, strove to make this about optimizing health and um, having equity in our county, which we feel is the one piece that often was lacking in Delaware County in many ways. So, um, you know, there, that's the central part. I'm not going to read the whole mission, but we really want to make sure um, that those things are at the forefront and everything else drives that. So our leadership, our accountability, our collaboration, is really about ensuring optimal health and equity. Um, and then our strategic goals and key activities. So this is what, what are we working on as a county to um, make sure that we're uh, you know, driving the health department where it goes. So we did like, you know, worked on securing support and funding. And so we had committees working on a series of meetings with the Department of Health and um, particularly around Act 315. In fact, we met every Friday for like two years with the Pennsylvania Department of Health. <laughs> um, so, and th you know, they, that was just one of the pieces of the things that we interacted with. Um, then we had, uh, you know, working on public support communication strategy. So, you know, the foundation really took a large part in driving that, um, engaging key stakeholders. So we had many um, listening sessions across the county um, with some key stakeholders. But we also made sure that we had um, think tanks and um, things open to the public. Uh, so establish, you know, where are we around program plans and policies? Um, what informed that was a lot of what was our listening sessions, not only what was required in Act 315, but what did the community tell us? 
one of the interesting things, and we did have recently, um, I think some um, league members might've been on it, but for example, behavioral health. Well, behavioral health is, you know, generally a piece of our human services function. We see, um, you know, there is of course a health um, component to that. So how do we merge um, the, these two departments in the county, for example, um, was one of the things that came out of the recent um, community listening sessions on behavioral health. So here's our board of health members. If you haven't seen it yet, uh, um, as mentioned, I'm the chair uh, to 2026. And then Dr. Lily Higgins, um, who is with uh, Keystone First and is the chief medical officer for them. Um, and she has been a great asset in helping us, um, particularly around Medicaid issues. And then Dr. PJ Brennan, who is the chief medical officer for Penn Medicine. Um, and, and he's an infectious disease specialist. So you can imagine in COVID, um, we've been talking to him a lot. And then um, Dr. Amory Hirsch, who is um, an epidemiologist and is with Geisinger Health System and has been really helpful, particularly with our interviews around the, um, with the epidemiologist and really um, around COVID um, as being another you know, resource and consultant. And then Oni Richards, who is with the um, African-American Family um, uh, Organization and has been really great community link um, and voice um, for many in our community. So a great uh, Board of Health. Um, the Board of Health was interviewed by um, the steering committee and, and then approved by uh, County Council. So the next thing that, that we um, started looking at and was informing um, the information that we had to present to the Pennsylvania Department of Health is really looking at what are the leading causes of death and leading causes um, based on other factors such as um, you know, ethnicity and race. And so uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you can see that the, the leading causes um, of death are in Delaware County are disease of the heart, uh, malignant neoplasms, um, you know, and the number of interesting, and sorry, I just realized that these are a little off as far as the numbers, but um, the really critical though is when you look to the other side and what is the le leading causes of death. And what comes, what came out to us and um, was really looking at our African-American black population when diabetes and assault really became, um, you know, the fifth and sixth leading causes of death versus, um, you know, other leading causes of death in our white population. And so this is one area that we feel, um, for example, that we might be targeting uh, as a health department in really looking at what are the underlying causes of this and what are the interventions that might um, bring down some of these numbers. And certainly we're gonna be looking at all of these. And you know, one area that we can work with our hospitals, for example, is on septicemia. And then just really working with the community and having awareness of that, um, you know, and working on areas um, with our communities and seeing what interventions they think would work. And again, this is just an, uh, another, um, overview based on the inequalities um, that we're seeing in our communities. And so I'm just gonna move this down a little. Uh, so if you're looking at health inequalities in Delaware County, um, we then take some data and we looked at some age adjusted death rates and um, versus crude rates and, uh, and birth rates. And so it just helps to continue to paint the picture of where we're at. Um, where, and looking at the numbers, what is high, what is low, what is, um, you know, giving us an indication of where the county is at this time. And again, um, we are looking also at some behavioral health um, information, which has, again, um, keeps coming up as, you know, one of the frequent um, causes of um, morbidity and mortality in the county. Um, Again, I, and we're just going to highlight again that we are in the middle of a syphilis epidemic. Um, these 2019 um, numbers are actually uh, significantly different. And um, I wish I could have updated this, but we were only given the numbers internally. But I can tell you that we did send a letter to all physicians in Delaware County that, um, that might be interacting with patients that have um, sexually transmitted diseases because um, the numbers basically doubled in two years. So not a good trend. 
and we hope to um, curb it once we are fully activated as a health department. And then looking at um, COVID-19 mortality in Delaware County, um, again, you know, looking at by um, percent of the population and COVID deaths. And so really shows us again, um, you know, where some disparities may lie. Uh, and you know, just another example of where we are with COVID vaccinations, um, you know, still have uh, a ways to go, but we are around 72% of the uh, population starting from the age of five um, to 100 is vaccinated, which is really great. Um, but you know, lots of people still need to be vaccinated. And basically from my experience with um, Omicron, that if you're not vaccinated, you're gonna get vaccinated by Omicron. <laughs> so, and on that subject, I was gonna just uh, explain some um, of the data. Most recent, this is January 7th. This is from the early warning um, system from the Pennsylvania Department of Health. And we've been really, really tracking this, particularly um, the week before Christmas, um, I, I will say the alarm bells started going off in our county. Um, and we did some comparisons with um, Montgomery County and Chester County, as well as Philadelphia and Bucks, just to see where we were at. And, you know, as you can see from this data, we are significantly um, higher in the incidence rate. So incidence rates are calculated per 100,000 and kind of gives you versus like case rates, which are important, but even with case rates, we are significantly higher um, than Bucks, Montgomery and Chester counties. Um, incident rates helps us bring it into the population per 100,000 and gives you an idea of um, from the previous seven days to January 7th, how high are um, COVID cases. And this is just for PCR tests. This does not include all of the home tests that were done. And you know, most of us in public health see our PCR test positivity as 40.1%, which is extremely high. Um, you know, I, was, I would get worried at the beginning of COVID when we were um, going over 10%. 40% is just crazy. And <laughs> we um, anticipate, you know, so what I'm telling people is um, basically, you know, if you haven't gotten COVID, you might get it, um, particularly if you're unvaccinated but that you know, most people will be exposed um, if they haven't already. And we saw a huge spike after um, particularly the Christmas holiday. Um, we had, I, I can't tell you how many case investigations have gone back to sources, unfortunately, of being family gatherings and church going um, were really the primary sources of this outbreak. And many, many, many people, many people reported not wearing masks at either one of those types of gatherings. And so we think that that contributed a large part to the spike that we particularly saw in Delaware County. Delaware County traditionally throughout COVID, particularly with the suburban county, so like Chester County, Montgomery County, Bucks, we were aligning more with the, so Philadelphia would get it, then Delaware County got it, and then everybody else. So I think we're on um, our trend, and let me go to the next slide and you can see that, our trend started earlier, 1225 is really when we started seeing these daily number spikes. Um, and you can see going um, you know, to the 10th that we were on this upward trajectory. Um, recent data that I got today is giving me hope that I think we finally hit our um, peak. It doesn't mean that we're, we're gonna be suddenly out of this peak, but with Omicron that we have seen versus the other variants, which were more like a bell curve, the Omicron was a very um, steep increase and a steep decline. So we anticipate, I'm hoping if our data is correct, that um, we might be beginning to see us going on the decline. Now that doesn't mean the rest of the region is gonna be with us. They, they're probably about two weeks behind us, um, except for Philly. And this again is just showing you some of this information um, about Delaware County versus some of the other counties um, in vaccines and who's fully covered and not. And then here, sorry, I'm just dealing with a pop-up that keeps coming up and then, there we go. All right, um, we want to ensure all programs. So what are the phases? So 
we broke up our guidance for the health department in the big picture way into three phases. So we're just entering this phase one, and that's really just getting us up and running and meeting all of the state requirements for Act 315 to ensure that we're going to get funding and that we are meeting the um, services and that have been previously provided by the Pennsylvania Department of Health. And then we're going to, um, you know, really, as I mentioned, data, 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 we're going to be collecting data and really analyzing it. And that's going to help inform where we're going and then just really establish and maintain our partnerships. That's really our two year big push. And then as we go through, we're going to really look towards, um, you know, what some priority needs are meeting more national standards and then um, working towards our accreditation. Phases, programs, and services. So um, now we're adding in like what we call our programs and services that specifically just um, define how we're gonna do these phases. And this is really important to the Pennsylvania Department of Health. So um, the health department will have um, different bureaus. So personal health, population health, and environmental health are, are the primary bureaus besides administration. And so what are we going to do in that? So personal health is going to be focusing on immunizations, um, not so much COVID immunizations. I'm talking about the vaccines for children, um, looking at for catch-up um, vaccines for kids, and then adult vaccinations um, for people that might have fallen behind or um, immigrant populations coming into the county. We're also going to be really focusing on maternal and child health issues. Um, in the county, as I mentioned, establishing hopefully two new programs to address that. And then we've got to really do a lot around STIs, TBs, and HIV. All of those numbers have been increasing in our county significantly. And um, you know, we're going to have to put a lot of resources into addressing those. Um, our population health is going to be focusing on our continued pandemic and emergency response. So they'll be continuing to do testing and vaccinations throughout our county. Um, in, uh, disease surveillance is under this area. That would be our epidemiologist and our data analyst, and then doing a lot of community health education. Um, and the environmental health is going to hit the ground running. They're ready to go. We have 11 inspectors trained and ready to hit the streets, um, and they're going to be doing our food and water and sewage pools, that kind of thing, inspections. Um, we'll be doing, you know, going forward, a lot of case management, um, looking at focusing on violence prevention, housing security and food security, because they have been identified by a regional needs assessment as major issues in our region, not only just our county. Um, and so certainly that is gonna involve partnerships. And then looking at some environmental justice, you know, issues, particularly around air quality and lead poisoning. Um, so lots, we're gonna be busy, <laughs> a lot of stuff going on. And um, that's the last slide, so I'm gonna stop sharing. And there you go. So a lot of information I know, and, um, and it's just a really brief overview. Uh, you know, Melissa Lyons, the health department director is starting next week. So, you know, maybe um, later we need to get her oriented. She's coming from Erie. So just coming from Erie to Delaware County is gonna be enough of a cultural shock, but I would love to bring um, Melissa later on in the year um, to meet everyone and to give you a further update about what, um, you know, her plans are and how we're implementing um, the new health department. So there you go. Ready? I can take questions. <laughs> Thank you, Rosemary. The one question that's come up is, uh, are you able to share your slides with us? Uh, yeah, let me just see if I can get permission for sure. But yeah, okay. I, I'll probably just take out the written part, just give you the slides. Yep. Okay, that would be great. All right. So some of the questions that people sent in before today, uh, uh, include, are there employment opportunities for Delco residents in the new health department? And what's going to be the impact on our taxes? Good question. So let me go with the employment um, issues. So yes, we've been promoting um, the health department. The um, county has contracted with Public Health Management Corporation to um, help us in the hiring. And the primary reason for that was really um, we have, to, we have to hire 76 positions and the health department has to be operational by the end of January. <laughs> so we're doing really good. 
I'm on constant interviews all day long, but um, we, you know, have made a big dent, but we're struggling truthfully to hire um, particularly nurses. Um, yeah. There is a huge nursing service. I know Nancy would know <laughs> there's a huge nursing shortage right now. So um, we might be reaching out to you, Nancy, but looking to mm-hmm. see how do, how do we reach out and maybe um, look, you know, tap some nurses that might be looking for a change, you know, after or looking for um, maybe something that's not as stressful as being a floor nurse or something. So, uh, but yeah, so we are, we're doing pretty well. I think um, I feel if, you know, if we got approval, you know, today, I'm um, confident that we could operate our health department, um, you know, and do the basic service and continue to um, hire people. Um, We also um, are working with other agencies um, through our COVID response as well. So GHR Nursing and Monarch or temporary um, em- employers for um, the COVID response. Uh, if anybody's interested, I do recommend they check the PHMC website and the county website for positions. We are also, and I'll make sure that they send it to maybe somebody, um, we're gonna have virtual job fairs hmm. that PHMC is running on our behalf. Um, we are really trying to hire people from, um, you know, our community throughout all of our communities in Delaware County. And so we, um, our initial virtual um, town halls are gonna be focusing on the city of Chester, Upper Darby, um, those areas. But um, certainly, you know, we're gonna be doing other events. Uh, you know, 76 is our number to get the health department started. Um, to be a fully functional health department as we grow, um, you know, we're looking probably to, to end up around 130 employees. Wow. Uh, regarding taxes. So good news is that because of COVID, we've been able to do a lot of things using some federal dollars. And I can say that I tried to be smart in things. So for example, for our COVID response, um, I have been able in the beginning, you know, I had to get um, about a hundred computers so we could operate our vaccine clinics and do a whole bunch of things. So obviously, those computers can be used by the health department. So we try to be smart as we build up our COVID response using federal CARES Act and ARPA funding. Um, our vaccine, um, you know, for example, our mobile units and things like that are things that we used throughout um, our COVID response that now you know, could be transferred to the health department. Um, and then, uh, we will get, count. so we do get funding, federal and state funding as part of the health department as an Act 315 health department. The county itself will be responsible for about 30% of the budget. But because the county has been receiving ARPA funds and CARES Act funds and county services were significantly reduced during COVID, um, my information from the county is that there should be no tax increase related to the health department or tax increase for the county um, in general. So that's a good thing. Um, you know, things economically, it changes in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on the services and things that the community needs and requires, and, um, you know, things could change. But we're really going to be actively um, looking for additional funding. So, for example, because we had a health department. We were eligible and we got $175,000 from Trinity Health System to do community vaccinations in our homebound program. So that's another example of leveraging what a health department could do and working with a community partner because they couldn't do, they didn't, they weren't capable of doing, going out into the community and doing um, homebound vaccinations. And we set up a whole program and they're like, great, if you run it, we'll pay you to do it. <laughs> so, so that's the kind of thing that we can do. And I think, um, you know, as we go forward, we've um, already applied for several different grants um, in different areas of the health department. Our team is amazing. Our um, um, administrators of each of the bureaus are just really enthusiastic people. Um, and then we have Dr. Victor Rulon, who is our epidemiologist, who has tons of experience writing grants. He worked for NIH. He's, he's amazing. I, he, um, loves data and he loves putting um, program plans together. So he's been great in um, helping us move that forward. So 
I'm optimistic. Um, I can't, I will never ever promise that because who knows where the economy goes. But right now it looks like um, no tax increase from the health department. That's amazing. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions that are interested in epidemiological records, the county health department's role in maintaining them and people's ability to access that information, particularly with interest in, in relation to gun violence, drug overdoses, and domestic abuse? So great question. And I just say that, you know, there are all the, some of the things that I wanted a health department for to advocate for this data being available. So, you know, in my previous job, I'll just use this as an example, working for a nonprofit, you know, for the nonprofits themselves to write grants, it's critical to have access to data because, you, you know, you need to prove that you can, your intervention is needed in your community, for example. So yes, so to the extent um, we will, our epidemiologists and our new health department director are committed to having um, public access to information. As um, Now, there, we are, there, so I will preface that by, so we have access to like really detailed data now that um, as a health department with, well, we won't have it until we're officially approved, but there's a thing called PA meds and that's where all of these um, of the 72 reportable diseases in Pennsylvania are like tracked. Um, so we will have access to that. We can't give access to other people to that data, but our epidemiologists could certainly run um, different data sets and give you like, you know, a good picture, but he can't give you the raw data. Mm -hmm. um, and that being said, we can't take every um, person in Delaware County's individual, you know, need for a data point. Um, there are going to be there's going to be a process to that, but we'll have as much data as we can publicly available. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple questions about mental health. How will the health department deal with mental health issues, and what crisis centers are available in Delco? Ooh, so that's um, it's this might be a leak issue. I will be making you aware. So. Um, Crozier Health System, which has been um, a large part of particularly for severe mental health issues um, and crisis, um, is having a lot of financial difficulties and is starting to close some of those things. So um, the county is now looking into um, working with our human services department and really looking at um, that. I think they're going to plan a truthfully a, a meeting of community partners and people to, to strategize about that. Um, the actual resource list, I, that is not my purview, So, but I can um, connect you with the person that can give you all the list of the crisis centers, um, if that's helpful. In fact, I'll write that down so I don't forget. Um, but yeah, so we, but it, mental, I, I mean, there was two epidemics, right? We had the epidemic of um, COVID and now we're having the epidemic of mental health crisis from COVID. And so we're all very aware of it. And the trick now is how do we make interventions that can be accessed? And you know, one of the biggest things is people aren't able to get an appointment um, with a healthcare professional about mental health issues now. It's really, really difficult. And with um, Crozier cutting down even more on services, that's gonna be even harder. So I think we're at a critical point. Thank you. Another question here is how can the league best support the efforts of the health department? Great, I'm so happy you asked that. So uh, there, there's a couple of things that, um, and I'm sure that Nancy, as she's working on her committee, um, can delve into more. But so one of the things locally for the county health department, you know, um, is I don't. It's publicly um, said, but I can explain a little bit. But I can't go into Detail. Um, so we're being sued by five municipalities in Delaware County about the health department. And so having um, support, you know, through social media and letters to the editors and things like that in support of the health department is, is critical right now. Not that um, that won't prevent us from opening the health department, but it's just, um, you know, another thing that we're dealing with. And um, so I can't talk too much about the lawsuits, but I can tell you it's it's around um, inspections, around environmental health, so restaurant inspections and things. That's all publicly available information. So that's, um, but I think you know just generating. Um, we're gonna the Mendoza Group 
has been contracted through the Delaware County Foundation and they are gonna be doing a huge media campaign once we're officially approved. And um, so support of that media campaign, you know, we're gonna have signs on buses and social media. So if you see those things, just, you know, um, like them, share them, tell people, um, you know, if you're in conversations with community members, like, oh, the house barn's a really good idea and here's why. Um, so we can share that toolkit with you guys too. Um, and then statewide, as I mentioned, um, there is this movement for um, nine other counties to have health departments, but here's the big rub in Pennsylvania. Um, Act 315 says that a county would receive $6 per person um, maximum from Pennsylvania. I and mean, keep in mind that was written in 1951 and has never changed. And our Pennsylvania legislature has played games with that. And so what the allocation that most can the counties receive now is $4.39 per person, which is less than what we had in 19. 51. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, I think, um, well, public health might have gotten a bad rap through COVID in some ways. Many of the issues that have been with the public health response in Pennsylvania have really revolved around um, the lack of public health infrastructure and funding to support that over the last 20 years. So the Pennsylvania Department of Health is significantly less staffed than it was 20 years ago. Um, mm. And that's, that really showed itself in, um, and I think we can all agree through COVID, you know, they just did not have the staff to respond. And, um, you know, I think individual health departments. So, you know, in talking, I worked a lot with um, Chester County Health Department who was responsible for Delaware County the fact that we had to have another county be responsible for Delaware County in the middle of a pandemic showed you how stretched the Pennsylvania Department of Health was. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm really grateful. I mean, I'm not, a, the Pennsylvania Department of Health workers went, I mean, they, those folks work seven days a week for two years. I mean, and many of them are burned out. And so many of them now are retiring and we're going to have an even bigger gap of people. And the way that the Pennsylvania legislature set this up it's really, really hard for them to replace the people that are retiring. It's mm. like a built-in automatic change to, to keep the health department, you know, not growing. They just limit how many people they can hire. So those positions aren't replaced once a person retires. So it's really bad. <laughs> uh, I, I'll give you the, the person that um, we work closely with to form the health department um, just retired at the state. And that's the communicable disease section. And he's been with the health department for, for almost 30 years. And he's like the last person that actually knows what it looked like in 19, you know, the last health department in Pennsylvania was um, formed in 1989. And he said he used to have a division of 20 people and now he has five. Wow. Okay. So, you know, I think that's an advocacy issue for sure for the state. And then the other issue, which is, this is a, actually, I was gonna raise up to everybody. So there's a weird law in Pennsylvania that was passed in 1995. And it was, and the law was passed because at the time, um, the Pennsylvania Department of Health because of staffing shortages was closing um, county health centers like we have in the city of Chester. And so they passed this law that says the Pennsylvania Department of Health can't ever close a county health center. And, they kind of forgot about Act 315 health departments because nobody was thinking about it because there hasn't been a one in a long time. So they didn't have a clause in there ex to say, except for if a county establishes a county health department. And so we actually have a problem right now. We actually have to introduce legislation because the Pennsylvania Department of Health can't close the health center in the city of Chester, um, even though we're standing up a health department. And they actually have to keep people at the health center. And so we're trying to decide now, how do we service the people that they serve? The other problem is that building that the um, Pennsylvania Department of Health is currently in, in the city of Chester is owned by the county and it needs repairs. And the, that is also where we were gonna have the county health department have a satellite office in the city of Chester in that building. 
and we can't go in there now. So we have had to rent another site, mm. um, city of Chester, because they're not leaving. So, <laughs> so that one we will need help. As soon as I get a bill number, I will send that to you guys because it's crazy that we even have to go this route. But yeah, we have to amend the 1995 law. Thank you. I think that between your talk and this discussion, we've touched on all of the questions that were submitted in advance. So Kathy, you can uh, take a look at the questions submitted this hour. There were some interesting questions uh, submitted by um, people in the chat. Um, one person asked, how, are, how is the elderly population being addressed? Mary Payne wanted to know, was the AAA involved in the planning? That, yeah, so um, we did reach out to the AARP. Um, so there was different topic areas and we did specifically um, look at, um, you know, populations like maternal child health and, um, and senior care. Um, so yeah, so we definitely is um, an issue, particularly in Delaware County, because we do have an aging population in Delaware County. Um, and so we are concerned. Uh, the other piece of that is we are um, looking at the community needs assessment. So that's not fully complete. And um, once the regional needs assessment's done, um, it'll be a better picture, but at least on the meetings I was at regionally. So this is all the five counties in this region um, who were doing the needs assessment. All of them have highlighted um, the issues around senior care and that as a special population. So now we just have to figure out what are, what are the interventions that we're thinking based on, again, the data. Um, I personally, you know, so for example, for the hospitals in this needs assessment, you know, everybody, the two things that they were highlighting was um, falls, fall risks, um, and then um, education around nutrition because a lot of the issues around senior care is some basic stuff, right? So um, as people get older, they don't like to cook, they don't, you know, they're tired or they have physical um, you know, limitations. And so you know, um, eating a healthy diet, um, just basic things you know, around uh, fluid intake. And so dehydration is often the cause of many issues in seniors. And it can also, it's a fall risk, right? So you get dehydrated, you get dizzy and you fall. And so these are simple. So looking at interventions in community health education that could really um, you know, have an impact on some of those things. That's just a small sampling. Um, so as we get more information, we certainly will be looking into that. Um, someone was asking, and I noticed that a lot of uh, the st statistics you showed mentioned gun violence and other kinds of violence. Uh, one person, uh, Michelle Hun, wants to know with regard to reducing gun violence, does the health department have gun locks available to give out? And if not, would you be open to getting some from government groups or the Radnor police or other police departments? Yeah, so um, Melissa Lyons, our new health department director, actually it was really interesting when she was interviewing um, one of the things she mentioned was really working closely with the district attorney's office and, um, and looking at you know, reasons of violence. So not just gun violence, but domestic violence and other issues, because she does see them as a, a public health issue. And um, so I, I can't really comment on the gun locks specifically, because I think that's something, you know, again, we're going to have to work with the, the partners, but certainly if the district attorney's office and other um, people one, you know, we're willing to work with us. I can't see why um, we wouldn't, you know, think about having that kind of program. Um, you know, in Delaware County, a lot of the issues around gun violence, um, one is the access to guns, but <coughs> when you look at the, the numbers again, it's in these specific communities that we really have higher rates of gun violence. The city of Chester would be one of them. So, you know, what, in talking at um, our town halls, what was really emphasized to us about that from those communities is gun violence is not just somebody buying a gun and using it. It's the underlying social conditions that create those environments. And so, you know, people don't want the, while having gun locks is important, a lot of people feel 
that we really have to start addressing these underlying social conditions that breed this kind of ongoing violence. Will that be a purview of the health department addressing the underlying issues? So, you know, um, the great thing about the public health 3.0 is that we see this as a community. So we're not in charge of it, but we may be the convener of it. So, you know, getting people together to figure out solutions. So we may not be the person to implement it. Maybe it's decided <coughs> by having, you know, different agencies and the health department and human services and the DA's office, as well as community groups. Maybe it's this decided that the health department, you know, would take charge of this piece and somebody else would do this piece. But somebody, the point of having the health department is somebody is actually trying to actually convene it around this issue based on the data that we created or not created, but, you know, analyzed and then addressed. Um, Viola Crawford was wondering, <coughs> will there be any help focused on people with disabilities? Many young people with disabilities show an ability to have a normal life and just need help to be successful. Yeah, again, I think that is really something that we're, you know, um, the convener on and bringing in more partners to, um, you know, address what, you know, people with disabilities are telling us. I really hate when we have interventions that come from, you know, a group and not talk to the community. So I think it's critical to really talk to the people who, you know, what we think would be the intervention and how does that work? Because oftentimes, you know, even around COVID, um, for example, we have a, the health center in the uh, Yaden is giving vaccines. Literally five blocks away is this um, church that serves the La um, Latino community. And we're like, they kept asking us to come and give vaccines at the church. And I'm like, well, we're only five blocks away. Why can't they just come here? We'll make a special day. And you know, then I had to put my hat on. And then we started asking the questions and the people were like, well, there's a lot of people in our community that don't trust the government. So coming to a building that has a government seal on it, they don't want to go there. And so I'm like, okay, that makes total sense. So we, you know, packed up, <laughs> packed up, set a date, got interpreters, and we got a hundred people who first doses last week, first doses in that community. Because I finally like, the light went off. I'm like, oh, they're not coming to us because there's reasons for that. And so that's why I'm saying, you know, we have, I'm like, we have the vaccine. That's our intervention. We have it. We have the site set up, but that's why having um, community health workers and community health planners out in the community and understanding this issues really helps us because we all have our own internal prejudice in some ways, <laughs> like, and we all have like, you know, why can't they come five blocks, you know, because I'm like trying to schedule like a hundred different vaccine things, you know, but then I'm like, but that, you know, another lesson learned. And I think we have a lot of those lessons to learn. Um, do you have, can you stay for a few extra minutes? Um, yep. Okay, great. We, we do have uh, one or two more questions. Um, Olivia Thorne wonders, is there any plan for exercise programs to improve health? Yeah, so um, maybe not so much exercise programs, but, and this would, this is, I have to preface a lot of the questions that you guys are saying. I'm telling people, give us a year. We need to get the health department up. We need to get people hired and trained. So while I say there's lots of great things we want to do, and our staff is excited to do those things, I keep telling people we have to be good at what we do in Act 315 before we can jump and start to do all these other good interventions. So that being said, you know we've been talking about like um, you know county coordinating with county council because they have like an open space um, initiatives and plans um, all around. Um, that and then integrating that with, um, you know, encouraging exercises in our communities. And so I think that, again, that would be a case where we're going to be really looking at coordinating. We'll certainly do a lot of public health education around the benefits of exercise and why we want to do it. But um, one of the other things that we're thinking of doing, you know, is um, 
working with our parks, for example, making sure that there's walkable trails and um, and then that every community has access, right? So if you live in the city of Chester, it's very different than walking in Radnor. And so <laughs> figuring out like, how do we make safe and accessible um, areas for, um, you know, particularly our youth to get into that and, and different. Um, so we're, again, I think this is like definitely a partnership um, and where we might be just giving suggestions. Um, the last question that was submitted in the chat um, was you talked about the health department being approved and then you talked about it being accredited. What are the benefits of the health department being accredited and why is that a push for you? So um, the Pennsylvania Department of Health approves um, the a county health department, um, but accreditation happens nationally. And by being, a credit, by being a credited health department, there's multiple benefits. One, um, accreditation might make us more, um, a, a better selling point for organizations like the Kaiser Family Foundation. Like, so national foundation grants um, with an accredited health department, you know, is really, really good. So they, they want to, um, they don't want to just give money to people that are you know, saying that they're a county health department, there's all different levels of those, right? And it depends on the county that you're living in and the state you're living in and all those factors. So being a credit means you're willing to take it an additional step. Um, the other benefit of accreditation, and I think um, there is a lot of us in Pennsylvania that feel the Pennsylvania Department of Health should make that a requirement um, for all Act 315 health departments is it keeps your staff up to date on the, the latest information. It makes you every year evaluate where you, what you're doing, how you're doing it, and what trainings your staff have. And so it brings quality into an organization. And so that's from the very, very beginning, we had set accreditation as the, one of our first goals for the health department, because that's another way to improve quality. Um. Okay, uh, Jane, can I turn the meeting back over to you? If you can unmute yourself. Hi, I'm unmuted. Well, thank you, Rosemary. This has just been an incredible amount of information and very, very helpful. And um, we're very proud that you're a member of the League of Women Voters of Central Delaware County <clears throat> and all the work that you've done with the League getting to the point where we now have a health department a few days away. Um, so we thank you very much. And um, thank you to all the members of the board of directors who um, are always very effective and efficient in getting our Hot Topics programs um, into production and complete. So thank you all. Have a good week, weekend, everybody, and stay safe. Stay warm. It's going to be cold. Oh, yeah. And it's supposed to snow too. Um. <laughs>